Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to episode number 173 of Fight That's Weekly Wrestling Podcast, the place where we are going to be talking about Roadblock End of the Line and provide our predictions as well as talk about Sami Zayn. Zack Ryder unfortunately got injured just after winning a number one contender tag title shot on SmackDown Live. Is that unfortunate? Yes. Yes, it very much is. And we're going to be getting what am I very. Saying? You know it. Oh, that is that. That's horrible. That is just absolutely horrible, Keith. But thank you to Woo-hoo. everybody that supports the show every week. Remember, we are available every Wednesday night. We cover Raw, SmackDown, live pay per views, and tons more for just a buck. When you go over to patreoncom slash that, you get exclusive behind the scenes updates and a raw and uncut video version of the podcast. If you want more features, just head on over there. My name is Juan Velas. I am from the shining star of the Caribbean. He already spoiled it. He's back, folks, from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. No longer sick. I, w- I, w- I almost thought sick Keith would rhyme, but it doesn't really rhyme. So I'm just going to say Keith. It's Toshik. not even close. I try. I am uh, relatively plague free and I am happy to be back because, man, it was bad last week. We spoke for a little bit and spoke is kind of a sad way to put it because I could barely talk. Yeah, it you was, said uh, it, it was horrible. a bad time, but I'm back. Welcome back. And the other hey. guy that uh, he's uh, he's now apparently getting sick. So hopefully Ryan makes it out of this podcast alive. Ryan McNulty from Boston, Mass. How's your I health said, doing? I said I was next, didn't I? I said it last week. So here it is. It's not quite there yet. We'll see. But you knew it was going to happen. Goldberg's coming for you. It was inevitable. Well, we're just a week away from uh, Christmas. You know, happy holidays for everybody that's celebrating There's a lot of culture out there, so everybody celebrates something at some point during the year. So whatever it is you celebrate, make sure to do so. Just a quick tidbit, by the way, anybody that wants to engage with us, because next week is the holiday edition of the podcast, send us uh, tweets or, uh, you know, bite that cast or uh, comments on YouTube or bite that cast at gmail.com. Let us know which is your favorite Christmas gift that you've received. And then we can talk about some of those as well as bring up some of our own next week. But today, we're going to be talking about Roadblock End of the Line, as I mentioned before. But we're going to leave that conversation for the second half of the show. So we're going to also give our predictions. Uh, But before we go with anything else, as always, uh, talking about Twitter, we set up a poll after Raw and SmackDown. And then the poll results with an out of four system. 38% of people give Raw two out of four, saying it was just all right, followed by 31%, giving it a three out of four now with smackdown live i changed things up a little bit thanks to mauro ranallo on the poll so we got 44 percent gave it three out of four saying it was go to mia followed by 37 percent at four out of four with a two pay suicida score so i'm not sure how this actually helps us measure maybe not accurate maybe you might have tampered but with it's fun. the numbers there it's fun michael it's fun yeah would you guys give uh, either Raw or SmackDown this week or Toad Pay Suicida? So like, even though we're going to give our predictions uh, for for uh, Roblox a little bit later on, because it was a go home show, I just want to give I, I want to get your your preview. Did you think it it was a good show to hype you up for the pay per view this Sunday? To hype me up for the pay per view this Sunday? Absolutely not. Uh, I would say both shows were all right at best. I would I would rate them both around a two out of four. SmackDown pulling ahead a little bit just because I think the match quality was superior. I was a big fan of the Battle Royal this week. But yeah, it was just an overall all right week in wrestling. And if this was a go-home show, not feeling it. For me personally, I would actually give the win to Raw. And I think the... Just the way that they told the story with the New Day was, for me, the most entertaining thing of the week. Now, was it a good go-home show, Raw? No, but I still liked Raw better than SmackDown this week. I'm kind of in the middle because I I got out of both shows thinking they were very solid. And uh, I think the New Day really did an excellent job at being able to not just break Demolition's record... But they were able to take down this whole wall where everybody knew that the WWE was just stalling, right? They were stalling, so they would break the record, 
but they had two kick-ass matches at both the beginning and at the end of the show. They had two matches of the night. So for whatever thing you want to complain about the New Day, they got the job done. So congratulations to them. And, and then we'll they maybe did a good job of planting seeds to give you doubt that they might lose the titles. So I thought that was very well done. Did you really feel doubt about that? When they show... Like okay. Maybe I'm just a little jaded this week, but I don't know. It just felt like, okay, this the New week. Day, they're just building... Right? Right that the okay they're building odds around the new day like that they it's going to be perceived that they'll lose but at the end of the day the wwe loves their records and loves breaking them so throughout the whole night i still felt like oh they're not gonna lose at all seeing the after party thing that they had ready before the match even began was where i was like oh man If they're already predicting something in wrestling, generally nothing ever goes to plan. And we were right. It didn't go to plan. It didn't go exactly to plan, but they also did not lose the titles. They, I I think they did a really good job. Yeah. I like the throw, uh, like they, they threw us off with the whole Stephanie McMahon thing, because the moment that happened, I thought to myself that that is how they're going to take the titles out of them or off of them, not out of them. They're not in their body, (laughs) but they really did a really good job, and uh, uh, well, we're going to get to Sami Zayn and the build-up to Braun Strowman in just a little bit, but I want to switch gears now to the Battle Royal. Let's talk about SmackDown Live now, and one of the topics is what happened with Zack Ryder. You know, super unfortunate where SmackDown definitely has the more solid tag team division with American Alpha. You know, uh, you got uh, the Hype Bros, etc., and this was, as Keith mentioned, a really enjoyable match. Zack Ryder wins it. Something weird happened at the end there, and he apparently has a knee injury. Now, we don't know the extent of it, but one thing that it's debatable, and I think we talked about this with Finn Balor when he got injured, but WWE actually recorded all of this. So right now, if you go to their YouTube channel, you can see Zack Ryder behind the scenes basically trying not to cry because the camera is like two inches away from his face. crazy. Yeah, as he's getting checked, I'm not sure... I mean, cool. It's part of the story, right? Because if he's gone for like eight months, they can use that footage. But you got to be thinking he's he wanted to yell the F word like 80 times. But because there's a camera in there, he's got to become self-contained, right? What do you guys think about WWE really capitalizing on that situation? You know, there's such a thing as too real. And that might just be a little too real. Like that's a that's probably a very dark and like questioning moment in Zach's career. And um, it would probably really suck to have a camera in your face at that time. I you feel know. for Zack Ryder. There's just no semblance of any privacy allowed when you work in the WWE. And that sucks because I don't think it should be that way. But at the same time, we get a lot of cool documentaries because of it. Yeah, it'll make a good WWE 24 one day. <laughs> woo woo woo. I still woo 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 after trying to still woo woo woo. It's a working title, okay? It's not really, really all that sold yet. But poor Zack Ryder. I mean, this has been such a weird year for him. He won the IC title at WrestleMania in a ladder match. That feels like it happened 20 years ago. Maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit. And now it seems like he's finally doing something. Maybe they were maybe, you know, they were going to become tag champions. But whatever the case, it yeah. seems like this is not going to be a one week injury. He may be out maybe even until WrestleMania, which would make a story in it in itself. Right. He won a huge match at WrestleMania. And then maybe they do that again. But with the tag titles this year or next year. I don't know what the plans are for Zack Ryder. Yeah. It's Poor safe guy. to say that. He will have a place when he comes back, probably with with the, you know, continuing with Mojo and doing the hype bros thing. But other than that, I, I really don't know what to expect. Exactly. And the, the nice thing about the SmackDown tag division being so strong is that, yes, it sucks that this opportunity might be taken away for the time being. But there are so many strong tag teams that uh, can fill that void for the t- can, or like can for we call now. It strong, I think strong. Yes, is a strong absolutely. word. <laughs> Between on SmackDown, you have American Alpha, you have the Usos, even Beauty and the Man Beast. All of those yeah, who are you about can to build. break up. Yeah, but still, e- even if they, 
you know, with when things like this happen, they have to adapt, right? So maybe that gets shelved for the time being. They haven't broken up yet, so there's always an out there. But there are with those teams that I mentioned and more, there are tons of people that can be considered strong contenders for uh, the Wyatt Family's Tag Team Championship. So while it sucks that it's um, that this happened to Zack Ryder and the Hype Bros aren't going to get their opportunity right now, it's not devastating to the tag team division itself. Yeah, so we could possibly I, I see a case it, it where American Alpha gets the title shot now. Because who else? We need a babyface yeah. tag team for this because it's you know it's the new Wyatt family. They they'll probably have to do another number one contenders match or something. But what I was trying to say is I feel like the tag divisions really on both shows are just at the line of passable, right? Because we can look at... Oh, I disagree so we can look much at, okay, with SmackDown. The talent? <laughs> sure. There's a lot of talent on, on both both brands. But as far as build and credibility, really, you get American Alpha, you have the Usos, you had... In the Hype Bros, we're kind of on the line. The I mean, the Ascension, Brizongo, a lot of these teams have at not really been... At least bring up the VOD villains for the crying Vaude out villains. loud. I mean, the yeah. they even lose in two those seconds. Teams, those teams are, are essentially jobber teams. You know, there's a lot of them are the golden truth of SmackDown. But... Things like that, the credibility and stuff, you can build in two weeks. You can build in no time at all. And just if as long as there's a strong story behind it, which there is on SmackDown most of the time, the perception of somebody can be strong. Look at look at the Usos at Survivor Series as an example, where if going into that match, if you would have told me that the Usos would look like a like a star top of the line ta- or a top of the line tag team at the end of that I would have called you crazy before the match but with their performance at uh, Survivor Series they really look like one of the best tag teams on the entire roster if not the best tag team on the roster so all of that stuff can be built going forward I don't think that's a problem if you looked at Smackdown at the beginning you would say the exact same thing you are saying you would say about the hype bros it's just that they've built the hype bros up over I'm these still weeks saying about, about the hype bros they haven't really been they haven't hit that level yet but certainly they can Perce- so what is that I level, see what you're then. saying if Perception. everybody if everybody's at that level what is that level that level well they actually I I, it's really just it's a feeling really that you feel that they are a credible team i don't think any of these teams are even close to the level that we perceive wyatt and orton at right a- any team right now you can line up any team on the smackdown tag roster and you and they're essentially going to get squashed by by or that's, that's a great. story in itself yeah. yeah that's a great story in itself yeah think about what you just said where any team compared to randy orton and bray wyatt i mean you also got luke harper who's awesome but maybe like three months ago, we were saying Bray Wyatt, man, he's got nothing. And we went from no, that well, well, yeah. to All he's right, let me, one of those top guys. Let me try to explain what I'm saying. We'll, we'll go with a tier system, right? If if Orton and Wyatt are like S tier, then I'm looking at American Alpha, uh, the Usos, who else? Uh, Slater and Rhino. They were like B tier. And then all the other teams are like c minus d tier that's what they feel like but yes that's perception a story can in itself certainly change but when you have a match coming up in a couple of weeks it's going to take a lot to get to to have a believable match taking place but it's probably just going to be a squash so it's fine i think it's a matter of just being patient because even when you look back at the tag division and the attitude era you had what the Hardys, the Dudleys, and ENC. Now, you had other teams like the APA, etc., but let's be perfectly clear here. Those were the three teams people talk about the most. So you don't need 50 tag teams for a tag division. You just need solid matches because even back then, they didn't really have storylines. The storyline was, well, we're going to have another badass match, and that's what made the tag division great. That's what makes the NXT tag division great. It's it's nothing about stories if you really think about it. Look at, you know, Johnny Gargano, DIY, etc., where the story is we have really freaking good matches and that's what gets us over. I think it's just because every other tag team here is fresh because even the Usos they're still dealing with being the Usos, right? And then you have American Alpha just getting out of NXT, then you have Breezango doing their thing and then poor Vaude villains losing every two seconds. So it's just a matter of being patient. But I think the talent is there. 
And as long as they don't have boring matches, they had a re- we had a good battle royal. We had right. a good battle royal. What else could we say to say this is at least somewhat enjoyable? Not only that, we had a battle royal where Victor from the Ascension looked credible in it. The impossible happened. That right there is the early Christmas gift for himself. He probably <laughs> cried a little bit. Seth Rollins Victor, fears okay. Victor, man. He does fear him. Never forget. But that's it. That's it for the uh, tag division. I just want to give a quick comment to something that I've been I've been letting marinate for a couple of weeks, seeing if it if it reduced or not. I love Mauro Ronaldo. He is a really cool commentator. He brings a JR esque contribution to the commentary team with uh, legitimacy, right? With sports type conversation. Now, when it comes to suicide dives, a.k.a. Tope Suicidas, and saying it the exact same way, a big part of me just wants to start crying because not only is that move overdone, I think that he's actually accentuating the fact that it's happening more and more because it's one thing to call it a Tope Suicida, but then to say it the same way every time, even if you're not watching the TV, you're already imagining Oh, man, they did that move again, and it just makes it more apparent, more obvious that they are overdoing these spots to the outside that they really should reduce. We have a we have a damn category in our award show in about two weeks where it's the you know things that WWE has shoved down our throats. And that is definitely a nominee because of that. And I wanted to get your thoughts about that. Do you guys think that maybe I'm just being nitpicky? Do you also notice this? And if so, what can be done about it? Not at all. I think that the suicide dive is late 2016's early 2016 super kick. It's just something you see way too much of right now. And people that really shouldn't be doing it are doing it. And it's almost in every single match. It's a uh, it's overdone. And Moro, as much as I love him, he's probably my favorite commentator on the WWE roster right now does not help it by how much he, um, like how over the top he reacts to the Tope Suicida. Tope Suicida. Every single time it's, um, it accentuates a problem that's there. They just need to cut, they cut back on the super kick. Now they need to cut back on the suicide dive. It's like they don't have any other way of knowing how to go to commercial break because a lot of times that's kind of the cue That's true. Survivor Series was also a wake up call when we got pretty much the exact same series of outside dives in two Survivor Series matches where a bunch of people did some outside dives. Then one guy goes to the top rope, jumps to everyone else on the outside, hit doesn't care that he's hitting his own guys at the same time. Outside dives are super, super overdone. Like, let's leave that for the cruiserweight division. How are we supposed to give a damn about the cruiserweights if everybody and their brother can do a damn outside dive? Oh, I have an entire conversation about that happening in just a little bit. So you stay tuned there because (laughs) I got a couple of things to say about the cruiserweight division and 205 Live. But before that, let's get to the main event scene here on SmackDown because Dolph Ziggler is now the number one contender. Anybody that's been listening to us for about the last two months, you know how we feel about Dolph Ziggler as a babyface character, about him not retiring, and then basically just looming around now. Now he's the number one contender. He's going to battle AJ Styles, but we still have Dean Ambrose in there. We got The Miz, who keeps getting better. The Miz is... I, I don't know really what to say about The Miz other than he's awesome. He's truly the glue to this show because the problem that I see with SmackDown is that Dolph Ziggler becomes a number one contender. So what? But then at the same time, okay, what if Dean Ambrose became number one contender? So what? We have these two guys that they haven't exceeded anything. It seems like they always have this, this uh, cap or this ceiling that their character does not break through. So it's just a matter of whoever the champion is, battles either option a or b but really it's the same story because as uh, lunatic and crazy as ambrose is and as whatever ziggler is he is i feel like we would have the exact same storyline regardless of who actually became number one contender and even though smackdown's not a bad show i think it shows a really big problem where it's not a bad show but to quote the miz it's not must see tv at least for me although i do enjoy it The thing with the main event scene right now, 
that I have an issue with is it's now what we're how many months in are we like four or five months in about yeah it's now becoming apparent just how razor wow, thin the-, the main event scene is that Dolph Ziggler was going for the title at SummerSlam right so he had his title match at SummerSlam then AJ moves to uh, uh AJ ends up winning the t- title at what no mercy and then we have Ambrose and AJ backlash backlash yeah was all right yeah I I Close forget enough. I always I still get confused about backlash being like later on in the year backlash. not after WrestleMania <laughs> so yeah basically we've are we're already going back to Ziggler getting a title shot, even though that was something that happened, over, you know, this past summer, because you know, John Cena's gone. Ambrose and AJ just had a, a super long feud, and one other babyface is there left for for AJ to face. There's n- literally nobody else. Yeah, it it almost feels like that the main event scene is the opposite of the tag team division where they spent so much time building up these tag teams and making them all seem on an equal level where they've had a complete failure with that on the main event scene where it was great. Like the AJ Styles, Dean Ambrose storyline was great, but then now you're left with like, oh God, what do we move on to now? I guess Dolph Ziggler, but... I don't know. I don't feel anything towards this Dolph Ziggler title run. Like of of one of the best feuds on SmackDown with the Dolph Ziggler and Miz thing, the inferior portion of that feud is now moving up and getting a title shot. And I don't doubt for a second that the AJ Styles Dolph Ziggler match will be great because I'm sure it will. But what's the lead up to it going to be? Is Dolph Ziggler going to do the, oh, I need to win this. I need to win this because we just saw that. I don't think we need to see it again from Dolph. And yeah, but all that being said, it's really hard to think of another option that is not just Dean Ambrose or John Cena. And a bigger problem here is that, think about this, everybody listening, because we have the issue as wrestling fans to overanalyze everything. This story has already been told because if Dolph Ziggler does beat AJ Styles, it's the same thing that happened when he became IC champion. Then what? He's the good guy that's champion, but there's there's nothing else behind it. So it's just a matter of him getting ready to lose it. I think it's just so so apparent that it's really easy to build up a good bad guy in WWE in 2016 or in, you know, modern era WWE than it is to build up a good guy that evolves without naturally just not becoming a prick because that's what happened with Dean Ambrose, right? Like the one time that we got a different character out of him was when he was sort of getting cocky against Dolph Ziggler and things like that. And then afterwards he said, Oh yeah, my bad. I, I just wanted to do that to really, you know, piss you off a little bit. So it's it's a big underlying problem because even though it's acceptable right now, we don't know when the draft is going to happen. And I think if we're waiting for a draft to happen, I just don't care about the story. I Give me the match, but on a, on a week-to-week basis, I feel like I could just not watch SmackDown, wait for the next pay-per-view, just look at the match and already know, well, Dolph already faced him, so then we got Ambrose somewhere in there. The story has already been told. We're already familiarized with it. So why should you watch SmackDown for the story? But even then, go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, okay. It's a holdover. We can look at it this way. John Cena will probably be back in time for a title shot at the Royal Rumble. Right? Yeah. So essentially, Dolph Ziggler's just kind of, hey, let's spin our wheels a bit. Let's have AJ feud with Dolph Ziggler until John Cena gets back. Then we can do the Cena AJ thing again. There you go. I mean, SmackDown, they're the roster super thin. So a lot of times they just have to kind of figure out ways to spin their wheels. So it's really just let's all chill. We'll wait for Cena to get back and then we'll figure it out from there. Is this title match for the Royal Rumble? No, though? that's because what I'm saying. It's going to the title match is at a SmackDown, right? In a couple weeks, I believe. So yeah. basically, oh. Royal oh, Rumble. Okay. That's when Cena will get his title shot. I'm assuming. Then none of this matters. This yeah. none of this matters. <laughs> yeah, the next SmackDown pay per view is the Rumble. 
which is both brands. Yeah, I think it's going to be a solid match like everything else, but I don't know if John Cena coming back is going to be the solution to all this, but we know no, that AJ Band-Aid. Styles and John Cena... <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a really good band-aid, though, because we know that him and AJ can tell a really good story. Plus, with the Rumble, you can get the club and other people involved. You find a really good excuse at some point. Something can happen. By the way, we're not going to cover Tribute to the Troops because it's happening right now. Yes, it was pre-taped, but uh, maybe if we check it out, we can slightly talk about it next week because it's weird just seeing it on paper without actually watching the show. But now, I feel like I got to bring this up and talk about... 205 Live. Now, I know that you guys, at least I'm assuming, you you didn't watch this week's live or after SmackDown. I fell asleep this week. You're a human being, man. You're entitled to to actually sleeping. What about you, I have no excuse. I just did not watch it. Real talk? I don't know why I watched it. And (laughs) Keith and I... Keith and I love the CWC. Speaking of the end of year awards a little bit earlier, we also I'll have even, a Best I'll Network I'll even say show. that so far, I've enjoyed 205 Live. I thought it's been not bad. The problem is, and the, it actually has the same problem from SmackDown with the main event scene, but escalated because you already see these guys wrestle on Raw. But then you look at yes. them on uh, 205 Live, and the moment they grab a microphone... Or you have a Lindsay Dorado, uh, Mustafa Ali talk this week. Um, Rich Swan, as a matter of fact, was technically the, the main event or the closing thing on SmackDown because he cut like a tiny promo just before SmackDown ended. And it was so robotic. You have the super charismatic, dare I say outlandish, cruiserweight champion in Rich Swan, But it's such a babyface, early 90s, late 80s promo. And everybody talks like that. Like they're not allowed to just flourish but then what i really don't get the one guy that sounds natural in the whole show is jack gallagher the extraordinary gentleman the guy with an over-the-top character ends up sounding more natural than everybody else so even though the matches are not bad we get good matches on raw we get good matches on smackdown we get good matches on nxt with high flying and tope suicidas so where is where does 205 live fit in this there's no purpose there's only one title and that title gets defended or shows up at Raw. I just don't get it. Why They're should I keep watching? Fantastic They're question. Basically, superstars with a roster. They're going to be the second class citizens of the WWE. They are the new divas, if you will. Yeah, the promos were just yeah. so bad, and I'm I'm hoping that this does change up a little bit, or at least have some kind of purpose. The Cruiserweight Classic was a tournament, and everybody wanted to win it. That was the whole the whole point. And then the cherry on top was the Cruiserweight Championship. Now they're teasing, I guess, like TJ Perkins is getting a little bit cocky. So he got out of the I'm homeless face, and now he's the I'm cocky guy face. So I like that. And they finally changed the lower part of his entrance that still showed him with the title. Yeah, they now finally he's got actually rid of the just title. Good. Yeah, so that, that's I really wonder good. If this is, I wonder if this is like a byproduct of how... Most of the cruiserweight division just went from the cruiserweight classic to 205 live. Like there was never really any time in NXT. Like, yes, some of them showed up every now and then. But you know how most of the roster has that nurturing time in developmental and stuff. Like it was kind of, oh, hey, you were big somewhere else. Now come be big here. And even with guys that are in NXT for a while, there is a little bit of growing pain where sometimes they sound weird on the microphone at first. And then it takes a while for them to really like sound and act natural. I wonder if this is just uh, like turned up to 11 on that one. Because, yeah, like you said, Juan, even in weeks past, while I've enjoyed 205, Five live some of those video packages oh boy are they rough like that noam dar one eh, that was uh, that's not something to write home about yeah noam dar himself is just something not very well to write home about when he has a a microphone in front of him but i wonder if that's just all a byproduct of just being almost rushed onto wwe television and the funny part is all of these guys are in nxt rich swan is in nxt Uh, noam dar has showed up and then Noam Dar, anybody that hasn't watched 205 Live and wants to know exactly what I'm thinking of, this is probably on WWE's YouTube channel, watch his backstage segment with uh, Alicia Fox this week. And that right there shows how how painful 
this is when you have talented wrestlers that just don't know how to talk. To summarize, 205, 205 Live needs their own NXT. They need, they need something in between so that they can develop that just a little bit more. And uh, folks, before we do get to our uh, roadblock end of the line predictions, I want to have a tiny conversation because this past weekend, the three of us met and we talked. We talked a lot because Boy, in just we two talk. weeks, we have our end of the year podcast special. So what's going to happen is that in RSS feed, those that listen to us on the road, you're going to get three podcast episodes. YouTube, you're going to get multiple videos throughout the entire week. We recorded three hours of podcast already, and that's only half of what we're going to be talking about. So it's it's going to look like six hours. How did you guys, now that we've been, uh, what was it, like four days ago, more or less? Yes, that checks out. How are you guys feeling, knowing that we recorded all that? I loved what we have so far, and I'm looking very forward to finishing that. And I think everybody out there uh, is going to love these uh, conversations that we've had around the year-end awards, and I'm uh, excited to know what you all think. Yeah, essentially what we did for the year-end awards is, you know, in previous years, we just kind of tell you the nominees and who won what while beforehand we kind of had a discussion and we debated oh you know what should be this what should be that what who should win each category well instead we just give you all of that you get the whole conversation of us debating who should be uh you know superstar of the year or or something like that so you get that whole process so it's pretty cool we're yeah we're halfway into it so far for the recordings and you know it's a lot of time the only my only complaint is just sitting down for so long it's it's nice we take your ass just to stand Ryan. up yeah my ass oh, hurts. suck it up buttercup <laughs> I'm, not, I'm really <laughs> enjoying it and i think you guys are gonna love it yeah we got over 15 categories and uh next week if you want to support us directly through the patreon campaign we talk about that a lot in It is the best way to help us grow directly. You know, you contribute to us. So as our way of giving back, we're sort of going overload with the pre or with the post production, I should say. And uh, starting next week, you're going to get early access for those that, uh, you know, support us with five dollars or more at patreon.com slash bite that you can enjoy a solid portion of the end of the year awards. So keep in mind, that's going to be on the last week of December It's going to be the full release but you can get that. Also on the YouTube channel, something huge happened uh, this week. Even if you don't check out the channel, just a personal milestone, I got very emotional. So I do these unboxing videos. I I get the wrestling loot right now, the pro wrestling loot. And every month they have a little, uh, this piece of paper that highlights what they provided that month. And then on the front of it, they they take uh, screenshots of different YouTubers. So I'm doing the unboxing video and then I see that my face is on that thing. And anybody that watched Aww. that video or watches it, you'll see my face just immediately reacting. And notice how I jump cut. And my eyes are slightly watery for the couple of seconds afterwards because it's a little insane, man. You do these videos for fun, and then you see that, right? And then I get to see your guys' comments about that. So I just wanted to say that, you know, bring that up. It's like a wanception, one unboxing one. Oh, Collusion. yeah. by the way uh, we do have uh, the Roblox review coming up this weekend on the YouTube channel if you want to check that out and regarding Patreon we are going to be talking about uh, the uh, 12 hour video game stream uh, in a couple of weeks you know we want to get the uh, end of the year award stuff out of the way but regarding showing some love and appreciation who do we got this week Rano this week for our patrons, we'd like to thank Joe Wingdingland, which is a really cool and interesting last name, Oliver awesome. Batista, USC Punk, and Peter D. Yeah, Wingdingland. It's it's like the font Wingdings. Like there's a whole land for them to yeah. reside. It's like there's a Winding amusement park. How, how are you That's guys a... overlooking Oliver Batista? It's not Oliver Batista, Batista, by the way. The Need animal. To the animal supports us, Michael. He unleashed his support, no, no, no. and we thank. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to. We're moving up. We're moving up. All right. Oh, he's moving up. Okay. So it is now time it. to get to our roadblock end of the line predictions. 
So as of now, we do have six matches. I don't see a tag team match placed on this, so there's a good chance that some of it will be added. But this is the official lineup based on the WWE.com website. Starting it off hot, because we just talked about 205 Live, there will be a triple threat match for the WWE Cruiserweight Championship. So we have Rich Swan defending against the previous champions, TJ Perkins and Brian Kendrick. Let's do Ryan, Keith, myself. I'm just going to go with Rich Swan on this one. I, I don't <laughs> have too much else to say. Wow, the investment in this match is real. I can really feel the passion behind your prediction there. I can there, hardly contain myself. It shows. But I honestly think TJ Perkins is going to win this one with uh, not by pinning Rich Swan, but pinning Brian Kendrick. It's going to be one of those cases where Swan loses the title without being in the decision. Uh, Perkins is going to ride this line that he's trying to line, keyword being trying, and uh, uh, win back the Cruiserweight Championship. I think it's going to be Rich Swan. I'm not a huge fan that we already have three Cruiserweight Champions in one year. And I think that of, out of all of them, He's the most charismatic one. He's the one that the crowd can maybe react to the most. Where I think TJ Perkins, he's he needs something more. He needs some more juice. He needs some more zazz, some more spice. Just turn into the curry man or bring bring back suicide. What's the worst I can? That's a TNA character for those that don't know. Thank that's you for the TNA clarification. Character, also known as and manic. Never. Never, ever, ever bring back suicide. So let's That's bring a terrible back idea. The name horrible. No, don't bring back Manic, suicide, whatever you want to call him. The dumb red mask with the dumb white face. Don't bring that back. It was terrible. Video games come to laugh, Michael. Up next, I want to talk about the lead up to this match. Also, after I bring it up, it is uh, Sami Zayn versus Braun Strowman with a 10 minute time limit. I got to slightly apologize to Mick Foley because I've been, I've been talking some smack, not on talking smack, but here I just dropped something, sorry. But I've been talking smack about how Mick Foley really hasn't been delivering so much. He, he hasn't sounded believable. So I actually thought that they were going to trade him on Raw. And when they were going to trade him for Eva Marie, I was totally on board. I was so happy about that. I was Corey Graves during that. I <laughs> wanted Corey that Graves trade was like, to yes. so bad. And then the bittersweet thing, psych, but we got a good promo, but then so many emotions because part of me was already thinking, wow, you know, we're going to get Eva Marie versus Sasha Banks, Eva Marie versus Bailey and Dana Brooke and Charlotte in a handicap match. But no, we are going to get this match. And they got some really solid fire out of Sami Zayn. It was believable. He's highly underrated on the microphone. And I think that any casual fan that didn't care about this match, if that segment between those two men didn't pump you up for that match, I honestly don't know what will. So having said that, let's talk about that if you guys don't have any more reactions to the promo itself. I thought it was a really clever way to build it. I love the fire from Sami Zayn, even if I still would have preferred that the trade happened because I think Sami Zayn will do a lot better on Raw. And come on, Eva Marie, on all red everything should be on the red brand, right? Long live the Red Queen! But awesome. actually talking about the match itself, the whole 10 minute time limit I actually think is pretty cool. It's an interesting way to do this feud. So I'm going to say Sami Zayn doesn't win, but will survive the 10 minutes and the match will just end with a time limit draw. Yep, I agree with your prediction where this match will end with a draw. It's like one. It's almost like a weird Austin Bret Hart situation where like Sami Zayn just gets the crap beaten out of him by Braun for 10 minutes straight, but he never gave up. He lasted the 10 minutes. That's a that's like almost a victory in itself without having to get the one, two, three. So you it's have gonna be it's gonna be one of those dead Sami Zayn matches where he's just oh like God. flopping all over the crown. Yeah. Like in in a normal match, Sammy or Sami Zayn usually <laughs> dies. I almost said Sammy Zayn, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Sami Zayn dies in normal matches. In a match where he's going to get destroyed, like I'll be surprised if he st doesn't stop breathing for a while or something like that. Should Sami Zayn start a faction, the Samily family? 
<laughs> yes, the Samily family needs to be a thing. How are we not overlooking that Keith just compared Braun Strowman <laughs> to Bret Hart? How are we <laughs> overlooking this thing right now? This is groundbreaking. Well, Braun Strowman is the excellence of execution and maybe the best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be. Just listen to his theme. It tells you it's basically that sound that at the beginning of Bret Hart's theme. Oh the, my god. And the Braun Strowman yell are basically the same thing. They elicit the exact same emotion. <laughs> so yeah, I think my comparison is Thank out. you, Braun. <laughs> So who wins Wait till this you match? see the Braun Foundation. <laughs> oh my we god. Both, we both said time limit draw, Juan. Thanks okay. for paying attention. Right. There, there is a time limit thing. Okay, so my case. Yeah, I, I think it is going to end up being that. And then ultimately, they're going to be in the Rumble. And then Sammy is going to uh, kick him out of the ring. Now we got up next. Let's get to uh, let's get to Big Cass versus Rusev. Just a classic singles match. I I do like how uh, I think you mentioned this last week, Ryan, where they're using Big Cass as the body and then Enzo as the microphone against Rusev. Now I'm looking forward to this match. A cool uh, cool position for Big Cass to be in. I think both guys are really benefiting from this feud. I'm gonna say that Big Cass gets the win with some help from Enzo. Yep, I agree with that. I think this is a match where win or loss doesn't really matter. I think the important part is that this is a showcase of uh, what Big Cass can do in the ring and like got to make Big Cass look strong in this situation. And I think Rusev is a great opponent for that. And I think it'll be a great match. Yeah, I'm hoping Big Cass wins because I don't see any scenario where then we get a match between Enzo and Rusev, but then Enzo wins. So either they make if that Enzo tag team wins, look horrible. It's from the help of Big Cass. Yeah, that's the only scenario I can see. But Big Cass sort of needs this win way more than Rusev does because Ruru, he's adorable. Nobody, he is unhateable. He is the Everybody only unhateable. Everybody likes a Ruru. Reigns wishes he could be like Rusev, right? No. Yeah. I, sure. Sure. Okay. Why not? <laughs> why not? Why <laughs> not? not? A lot of confidence behind that. No, uh, clearly not, but let's move on to the Seth Rollins versus Chris Jericho singles match scheduled for one fall. I'm going to go with Seth Rollins on this one. It, I actually am not really sure. I haven't even thought about who is actually going to win this match until now. So I'm just going to go with Seth Rollins. Maybe Kevin Owens gets involved. Not really Helpful. sure. I'll just go with the safe bet. Yeah, I think Seth is going to win this match. It's another match where it's the outcome is at least in, or like not very important. Like Seth is probably going to win. He's going to enter the Royal Rumble. He'll probably win it. At least I still think he's going to. But it's all about just having a good showcase. This is just a little one-off feud to uh, to buy some time until then. And I think they'll have a great match, all that being said. And, uh, yeah, I think Seth is going to uh, take the win on this one. Yeah, I agree. It's going to be Seth Rollins. I think that even though Kevin Owens has his match, that uh, he's going to get involved in some way, shape, or form. Because this is, this does seem to be like we're finally closing in on the solid conclusion, maybe a rivalry between Kevin Owens and Chris Jericho. So I think that's maybe how they go about it. And uh, that that's going to be it. So now we move on to the 30-minute Iron Man match for the WWE Raw Women's Championship. We have Sasha Banks defending against Charlotte Flair. I'm going bold on this one. Even though everything I've said in podcasts leading up to this is that they're going to follow the formula and have Charlotte win at the pay-per-view, I'm actually going to go with Sasha Banks. This seems like the finality of everything. And I just feel like Sasha Banks is going to win. They want to have the baby face win the final confrontation, the Iron Man match. Sasha Banks wins. Not to crap on you any more than I really have this episode. <laughs> but or the Bring last one. I, I don't think it's as bold as you think it is. Just because they've... 
really built that formula. And now, like you mentioned, this is supposed to be the finality. So it gives them a great opportunity to break out of it. And it's so unpredictable that it becomes predictable in a situation like this, I guess. But I do think I agree that Sasha Banks is going to win just so they are breaking out of that formula. And Charlotte, they if it's a big feud, if it's like the end of this big feud, a big moment needs to happen. And if Charlotte's uh, first pay-per-view loss is that moment, I can totally see that happening. Yeah, plus it's an Iron Man match. If there's any match where it's okay to get that loss, it's this one. You're bound to get tired. They can go the Bailey route where at the just at the last second, Sasha Banks gets like the you know the second pinfall or however it is they're gonna go about it. I think this this is probably gonna be the match of the night. I have no doubt that they can have the match of the night, even more so than you know the other matches with uh, Kevin Owens, etc. That being so said, I have a fun bonus prediction before we move on. Yeah. What do we all think the score is going to be? Ooh. Going to say Sasha Banks wins two to one. Yeah. I'm going to say three, two for Sasha. If it was a one hour match, maybe. But because it's 30 minutes, I'm going to agree because my pick is also uh, Sasha Banks. And I think it's going to be two wins, one loss or or they are going to tie and go to sudden death because I'd be surprised if they went so much of the route of other Iron Man matches uh, that have happened recently. I mean, it, it really, the Sasha one, not like we get these every week, but I think maybe we get a draw and then sudden death and a really, really quick victory for Sasha Banks. You know what I want to see? And this would probably be more for a 60 minute Iron Man match, but I want to see like a super high scoring Iron Man match. It's like 22 right? to 25 or something. It's just <laughs> that would actually ridiculous. be really awesome. That'd be hilarious. Like, you know how they do the uh, like the series of fake pinfalls where it's like, oh, yeah, they roll just, up schoolboy, but every single one of them is a pin. Yeah. Maybe if we got Hornswoggle and, and uh, El Torito back, it seems like that's the next WLC. Because the WLC match was actually pretty awesome. Watched it a couple An weeks Iron ago. An Iron Wee match? <laughs> that, that is a whole different thing I'm not going to get to right no, now. No, it would be an Iron Wee Man match. That's what it would okay, be. And then Wee Man better. is the guest referee. Oh my god. It's <laughs> How's Wee Man doing? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> like my first thought is, if is you're he doing okay? Man, send us a tweet. Yeah. yeah bite that cast. I'm curious. How you doing, man? How you we doing? Miss you. Now I need to look this up. Continue. While you look that up, let's get to then the main event match scheduled for one fall. And for the WWE Universal Championship, Kevin Owens defends against Roman Reigns. I'm going bold again. Screw Here we go. it. Roman Reigns wins. Because wow, really? Universal Champion and... United States champion. Forget what I said about Kevin Owens helping Jericho, whatever, in the last match. Because Chris Jericho will screw over Kevin Owens, turning babyface. Do you have, like, a wheel where you just spin it? <laughs> yeah. And then it's like, <laughs> Or okay, just fine. a dartboard where you throw shit and see if it lands somewhere? <laughs> it's just defy yourself. You know what? I've, I've figured out that it's much better to not play it safe. And to go bold and look like a genius if it actually works out. But then if yep. I do and it, I'm then... labeled crazy. This is double yeah, standard. You're the talking end of the about day... people transforming into Bray Wyatt and stuff, all right? Exactly. I'm Fine. not saying that Chris Jericho will come back as Fondango <laughs> here. <laughs> but think about it. That would be pretty good. But yeah, uh, I think that Roman's going to win as well. Um, I've been Keith, watching. Stop piggybacking my bold predictions for the love Sorry. of God. Like the last one, I honestly don't think it's all that bold. <laughs> it seems like that's probably the way it's going to go. And um, I think Roman wins his title back here. And s the more interesting story is what happens with the United States Championship. I think uh, I've been watching a lot of old WWE recently, and I've come across Stone Cold Steve Austin's Intercontinental Championship reign. 
A lot of people forget that Stone Cold never lost that title. He just kind of gave it away. So maybe this will be a situation <laughs> like that with Roman where he just kind of he gives... traded it for a six pack. <laughs> he concedes the Intercontinental title or the uh, United States title. You guys talking about wrestling. I'm just sitting here thinking like Ryan's definition of bold is like bold Doritos flavor. I think we got a question about Doritos a couple of weeks ago. Even though I don't consume Doritos, friends tell me that bold flavors aren't actually that bold. So, Ryan, you are our Doritos. And Keith Thanks, is like the man. Ruffles. Baby, you're my sweet chili heat. And then I'm like Pringles. Once once you listen to me, you just can't get enough? I don't know. Or Pringles the aren't opposite. bad. Fine. Pringles are you good. Know, Pringles aren't actually chips. Right. They're like they're 40% like chips. Or something like they're that. Like, they're called crisps. They specifically word it that way. Still good though. Pringles are evil in the way that it's really easy to eat just a whole tube of them. Like before you think about it, that entire tube is gone. But they're but your also hands the get only so messy. snack. Yeah, they're the only Less snack so than a bag though, of that, chips though. That makes you feel bad when you're when you get to the bottom of them because all of a sudden you're you're, you're like trying to jam your hand down the, yeah. the can. But at the same time, like you know, at the bottom of the can when they have those like broken up Pringles that you can just yeah. like tip the can over and just eat so all of the good. shards. And you get all it's that sodium best. up in you. Nothing makes you feel worse than finishing a can of Pringles. Yes. <laughs> I agree. So with all of that being said, I think <laughs> that's why Kevin Owens so is going to retain. So that's how we conclude Roadblock's main event. Yeah. So that main event's going to be sponsored by Pringles, but I don't think that Roman Reigns is going to win. Personally, I just don't think that the WWE Universe can handle him having both titles. Unless they actually go with a heel turn, which I don't think is going to happen anytime soon. How do you because do this? Because the WWE Just have them universe on the new day too. Oh my yeah. god, please. Wow. But you know, the WWE universe not being able to handle something in regards to Roman Reigns has stopped them before, right? So why wouldn't it stop them again? That actually didn't happen. I and almost just want him to go happened. full troll mode. Just give give Reigns every single title. Put him in the Iron Man match, whatever. Give him everything. Have him beat Rich Swan. <laughs> he can't <laughs> handle that. Become become cruiserweight champion. Just just go for it. Two of five live. Like although that that jacket that vest probably has him go over by like a solid eighty pounds or something. But yeah, I, I really do think Kevin Owens <laughs> is going to win. He just takes the vest off and they're like, oh, he's two of five. He's wow. two of five. Oh my god, it's like Piccolo takes that thing off and yeah, he's got the weighted armor on. <laughs> How do we go from wrestling to Pringles, Doritos, and Piccolo? I don't know. I think it's a good metaphor for just how excited we are for Roadblock end of the line because not really feeling it. it the, the, this doesn't feel like the strongest pay-per-view, especially with the Royal Rumble on the horizon, more than like most of the, uh, the B pay-per-views this year, this kind of feels like, oh, this is just a stopgap until we get to the Rumble. And TLC did not feel like really that. Are, they're losing that special feeling, especially when they are every other weekend. Yep. So that luster is wearing off, but I think they're going to tone things down next year from what we heard, which is probably for the best. Ryan, I can't handle that. I don't. Don't hype that up. Only to then uh, yeah, be let down when they had 20 of them. It, it's not fully confirmed yet. So yeah, gang, uh, after the Pringles talk, let us know what your predictions are. Send us a tweet or bite that cast at gmail.com or drop a comment on a YouTube. Yeah, now, do you like plain sour cream and onion or actually, barbecue? That is, yeah, okay. Man, we, because we're not feeling too we're going to talk about, Pringle flavors. Oh boy, sour cream and onion. It's, it's, no, it's pizza flavored. That shit lives in a realm of its own. Pizza flavored Pringles, I have there's not had nothing those that touches so, it. so, so long. But I don't think I've best. eaten those. They they well, even have, they have like Bloomin' Onion flavored Pringles, or at least they did. I don't know if they're still available, but they, they went way out there with the flavors. I propose a challenge for the three of us and everybody listening. This Sunday, we're all going to get a can of Pringles. And then talk about oh, how that either contributed no. or hurt. Yes, Keith, I know you're on a diet. You want to be on that BT calendar Man. for next year. We're getting Pringles for Sunday. Get Are the small can. 
I already feel really guilty about the fact that I'm gonna go see Rogue One Friday and I'm gonna go to town on a bag of popcorn. I you already can feel get guilty. One of those about tiny that. cans. It's like a dollar. But then do but those have a lot of flavors? Like types? If I'm going if I'm going that far, I might as well go all the way. You so know, do live it. hard, die young. So I'm gonna go all the way. Just win for that and autobiography. Take it, and do the uh take the two chips, make the make the duck beak and take a selfie. The ultimate duck face. Yeah, it's the true <laughs> duck face. The original duck face, <laughs> damn it. I dare the entire bike club galaxy to do that. Let's do the, the Pringles duck face challenge. And also All have right. have a roadblock in the background. We got to up the ante. We'll make sure to re- retweet. And I'll include myself to look like an idiot because because I, 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 I just do I'm that. I'm an idiot? <laughs> oh, okay. That too. Keith, stop being yeah. mean to us. Actually, don't I'm change. Sorry. Don't change who you are. But I'm extra spiteful this week. I have a week's worth to catch. That up is on. very true. That is very true. But <laughs> real talk, yeah. Let's let's get that happen and then talk about Pringles next week. Somehow transitioning all right. after all of that, I did not watch John Cena on Saturday Night Live because I forgot it. But I think Ryan, I think you watched it, right? I caught most of it. What'd you think of it? So I was pretty hyped up. And then I remembered oh that, oh yeah, SNL is very, very hit or miss. Someone made a great comment on Reddit saying that things like best of DVDs for SNL are almost a detriment in the way that they really show the top tier stuff. And then you realize that, you know, once in a blue moon, they actually have those segments that are really, really funny. So I was expecting a lot from this. And I think... I was pretty disappointed, not with John Cena's performance per se, but just that kind of the the uncreative writing. And I just felt like it was just not really the best they could do with John Cena. Did, did I think John Cena was like stealing the show either? Uh, no, I, I thought it was just like, OK. And Cena did fine, but he also didn't really do a lot to wow me, which is weird because I felt like his roles in in movies and the acting he's done recently i feel like has been really funny really good and this was just not really that uh so it was just okay i was expecting a lot more but it, it's still worth checking out just to see cena in this environment i'm maybe uh checking it out in a little bit maybe but the only comedy type shows that i enjoy like that have been the Chappelle show and then maybe some stand up but I don't know, just the idea of like watching Saturday Night Live. I watched some highlights because I know WWE uh, played some of those and I saw this on YouTube. I just think that, as I've mentioned before, you know, John Cena is going to blow up in uh, 2017 big. Like, I think that he is going to be a hit star in Hollywood. And then after 2017, we may see Cena every now and then. Like, if you watch WWE around 2003 when uh, The Rock was Hollywood Rock, I think that something like that would be an excellent way. Imagine the idea of John Cena being so big to the point where, you know, if they got to do a go home thing for him, just have him be bad guy. Like have him finally do something because he's not going to be part of the product anyway. Right. So why not go out? I know it's that now that is a bold prediction, Ryan. That's how you do a bold prediction right there. (laughs) Hollywood Cena. Yeah, man. Book it, bro. And then you bring back Hollywood Hulk Hogan, then The Rock comes back, and then and the Hollywood, Hollywood Miz <laughs> just cries because there's way bigger Hollywood people now. <laughs> oh my! And God. then the Bollywood boys come out and then just <laughs> <laughs> and then just ruin everything like the Bollywood boys do. Oh, we got to make that happen so badly right now. So this is about to get maybe a little bit more insane because before we get to the questions, we want to Batista you with a little bit of our end of the year award. So there's one award that won't be part of that. But Ryan, you set up a poll. So I, I think maybe you should introduce this. I, I got the I got the numbers, yeah. by the way. So don't you freak out. You got the results. I Because yes. I was like, oh boy, I better, I better pull those up. So we threw a poll out there and we wanted the, the bike club to determine one of the categories for us, and this is concerning Bite That and not WWE, for who was the Bite That co-host of the year. Oof. The nominees, of course, were Juan, 
Keith, myself, and Jeff. Naturally. You know, Jeff, Jeff, podcast favorite, Jeff. He doesn't get talked about enough, really. He really no, doesn't. He, he never really, and he never gets to make his points. We're always interrupting Jeff. He just has so much to say, but we don't give him a platform to say it. Yeah, so with that being said, a lot of you voted, and here we go. So tied in third place with 10% votes apiece, we got Ryan and Keith. So right I now, mean, you we're guys basically the, the same person, right? So <laughs> the people votes get, count yeah, out. People think we're the same person anyway. Makes sense. So we're just, you, you agreeing with yourself all the time, arguing. Right? Like I'm basically crapping on myself saying that I don't make bold predictions. <laughs> so good. So followed by myself, I got 33% of votes, which means that, yes, much deserved. The winner of the 2016 By That Co-Host of the Year goes to, give me some of that Brapadoo, folks. Brapadoo! <laughs> Jeff. God damn it. <laughs> Congrats, Jeff. Jeff. Yep. This we is why we can't have nice things. We didn't the give him a spoken. The bike club has spoken. They would rather vote for somebody they don't listen to. <laughs> so painful. Everybody was going, <laughs> well, we got three picks, but Jeff. So my pick goes to Jeff. It goes to show. This is why we, it's why we can't have nice things. Exactly, man. Exactly. But uh, thank you for everybody that, vote, that voted. So one thing we really do want to do in 2017, I should say, is just have a good time. You know, we want to be like JBL except not nearly as annoying or obnoxious. Although, every now and then, you know, we can't always <laughs> guarantee. Annoying. In all honesty, though, hey, I'm proud of the bike club. They picked the troll pick. They made me proud. Exactly. That was what Ryan was desperately hoping would happen because everybody loves Jeffrey Montgomery. That's true. Is that his name? Apparently, that's his name. So, remember, every single week you can send us questions on Twitter. By that cast, utilizing the hashtag AskBT. You can also send it lengthy, lengthy version. Bite that cast at gmail.com. <laughs> I'm so the Batista sized version. <laughs> send, it, send it over Gmail. Just go, key. All right. So, our first question I'm, I don't even know what to feel. I've just gone numb to you both at this point. So, our first question comes from Promo Neil, who asks, Namaste. Namaste. Namaste to you. Do you think Randy Orton should grow a beard and to join the Wyatts? And if he were to break up with the Wyatts, how should he do it? I think you need a beard to be in the Wyatts. It's like kind of ob- like an obligation, isn't it? I'd like to Cody see him grow it out with more. a mustache. Yeah. Just I, I really like this uh, this salt and pepper look that Randy Orton has going on with his beard. How it's like it hasn't shaved in a while, and there's a little gray coming in. I, I dig it. It looks good on Orton right now. He's an attractive man. What can I say? Always beautiful. But, yeah, I'd like to see some sort of gear change. Maybe pants. I don't know if that's too much to ask, Whoa. but pants. Now that's a bold prediction. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. But according according to Cass, those trunks are pants, right? <laughs> In his promo where he was saying, oh, I got my pants on when he was talking to Rusev and he's he's just wearing like the tights. It's like Sir, I just Enzo's block out boxers big Cass were talks. more pants than what Cass had on. But anyway, I'd like to see a little bit more of a change for Orton's gear. I agree. And as far as like how should they go about breaking them up, I think maybe a nice dinner. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. It's not it's not me or it's not you, Bray. It's me. Exactly. No, but how should they actually go about doing this? I think that first he needs to become more injected into the white family. Like he still sticks out like a sore thumb, right? So I think that if he turned on the Wyatt family right now, it'd be like, oh, okay. But we kind of saw that coming. He should go all in. Like, wear pants. And I mean that as not a joke. Actually <laughs> wear pants, Randy. And just do more Wyatt stuff. I love how he's now part of the, you know, the zip thing before they come out. Like, he is part of that. So that's really cool. And how should they actually go about breaking up? I think that they got to do something with Harper. 
I think that when they when they break up the Wyatt family, it should be all of it. The Wyatt family has been in a WWE since how long? 2013, 14? They've like kind Kane. of like split yes. up and gotten back together basically since 2013, I want to say. Yeah. Though. So I think that Luke Harper, he's somebody that they can do so much more outside of that character. Imagine him getting shaved. Like uh, Randy persuades, you know, Bray Wyatt to do something <laughs> like that. Is he like an animal or something? <laughs> <laughs> I'm They'll sure. make a Harper coat. <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> but doing something like that is actually a nice change. Where after the Wyatt family breaks up, I don't see a scenario where Bray can continue to be the same character. So in order for Randy to break up, they got to disband the whole thing and change everybody's characters. Otherwise, I don't think it's going to work. I know that that is also bold. This is the bold episode right now. But I think that's right. what should happen. Yeah, I don't think I'm kind of on the uh, the opposite side of things where I don't think they need to change much about Randy because besides getting older, Randy's appearance has been the same the entire time. But Randy Orton has always been about like facial features and the emotions that he uh, that he has. It's those little subtle things that Randy Orton's been so good at when he's like on point and as long as he keeps like with that dark evil look then i think that's all you need from randy orton you don't need pants you don't need this entire (laughs) gear change you just need go look at randy orton when he was in like when he was feuding with the mcmahons because that's still the same look in orton but it's those facial features that made him look like a psychopath that went the longest way and um, that's all you need from Orton. I don't want them to break up the Wyatts anytime soon. Like Juan mentioned, that seems like the easy way to go about it. I would actually like to see them get a long run out of this. Maybe like maybe this is the thing that finally gets this does more for Bray Wyatt than it does for Randy Orton. And right now they're in a good place with it. Um, but when it does happen... Probably just a quick RKO out of nowhere. Probably on Luke Harper. Keep the meme strong. I want to see it out of somewhere. No, you get it out of absolutely nowhere. Bold prediction. So thank you for the question. Our next one comes in from a lovely patron of this show, Job394, who asks, How do you guys feel about Finn Balor returning and winning the Royal Rumble? After that, he would then choose to go after the WWE world title and essentially moving to SmackDown. Which it's no longer the world title. It's now the WWE title. It's WWE Championship. Yeah, they keep... It was like WWE World Championship. Now it's back to WWE Championship. Make up your minds. Finn Balor returning and winning at the Royal Rumble. That's that's pretty bold, if, if I do say so myself. We're yeah, really we, we shoehorning really that into this episode. Yeah, yeah. Take a drink, <laughs> Take even a shot. though Keith said it. So, we don't know what the rules are quite yet for the Royal Rumble this year, but we assume if we were to go back to, you know, as is tradition, you get to pick whichever brand you want, whichever title you want to face for at WrestleMania. That would be pretty cool. The only thing is, I, I, I would be fine with it. I'm just not so sure that they immediately just want to shotgun Finn Balor back into the main event scene right after coming back from an injury. They might be a little gun shy about him, so they'll probably wait. But it would be a a sweet return to see him come back for the Rumble. Um, But, I mean, he himself said that Rumble's looking unlikely, but Mania is very likely. If Finn Balor comes back, he doesn't need to go to SmackDown, nor do I think he should go to SmackDown. Like, yes, they could use some top guys over there, but they could use some top guys. I agree, but they are going to build Finn Balor as the guy. He is going to be the front and center on the marquee dude when he gets back. And that doesn't happen on SmackDown. Unfortunately, that's always that's probably going to be a raw thing and he should be the face of raw because I don't know it 
it doesn't feel like they need Balor on SmackDown. Yes, we had this conversation about how they're missing top stars, how SmackDown needs like bigger star power, but I don't think Finn is that guy. Like, yes, it would be super awesome to see Finn Balor versus AJ Styles. That match would probably blow the freaking roof off whatever arena it was in. But I don't know, just Finn Balor and SmackDown don't really feel like a nice fit for me. I think he is perfect where he is on Raw. Yeah, agreed 100%. I think the problem with SmackDown is that they have enough good guys in uh, Dolph Ziggler and Dean Ambrose that are kind of normal. And when you think about SmackDown, it needs babyface characters that have a lot of personality. And aside from the Demon King persona, the, the moment demon. he grabs a microphone, they have the demon, the moment he grabs a microphone, a lot of that goes away. That happened in NXT, and that happened in uh, Raw for the little time he was there. And so I don't think he's the solution to that. So I would put him on Raw so that he can season himself a little bit more there, where he can develop more of that personality. And then afterwards, you move him to SmackDown or whatever. But I think that Raw is going to be the show where he definitely grows more than he already has. Indeed. So thank you for the question. Our next one comes in from TMK Tanner, who asks, Keith. Why the hell are you never around when people have questions for you? Right? Right? Because I'm incredible at timing. I'm good like that. Oh my, I think we just broke a record this week. Yeah, because... he's here for this question, though. That's yeah, no, true. Not just that, but usually whenever one of us is absent, the next week somebody else is absent. It didn't happen. This true. calls for a celebration. All right. Move over, Undertaker Streak. Because this streak just got broken. And it's much bigger. So thank you for the question. Our next one comes in from Gugui. Who asks, Is it a bad thing to have two champions face each other at Roblox, but only one title is on the line? Yes. 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 Really? I don't think it's that bad. It's not like this catastrophic thing. It's catastrophic, damn it. It's, no. it's catastrophic get to me. Get bold, Ryan. Get bold. Should I, should I, I should get bold. Should I talk like Mick Foley and just start yelling for no reason? <laughs> Why and not? Start talking about socks. Um, <laughs> Can I you say that? Is it okay situ- if you say that? Yeah. I, Can I, you I just say wanted that? to make sure, Keith, it's okay that, that I mention this because I know we spoke about this personally, but we hadn't discussed if I should mention this on the show or not. But, you know, Keith is a very generous person. You know, he puts his socks on one at a time. It's very generous. Anyway, for this, I just think the U.S. title, it seems pretty irrelevant right now. Reigns just kind of has it. And then the fact that it's like Owens doesn't even value the title enough to even want it to be put on the line. You'd think if it's champion versus champion, Owens would be like, hey, I only have, I can only lose. I, I don't have anything to gain. I just keep my title. Shouldn't I have something to gain here? But Kevin Owens is a bad guy, right? He should like want he's, more. he's a prize fighter, and there's a prize yeah. with the person he's feuding with. He should but want that prize this, fighter. Um, in the uh, like in this championship run, he's like kind of defending it at a minimum here. Yes, there's the whole prize fighter thing from before, right? So from a character standpoint, why would his character want more work? You know what I mean? Because Why would he want more matches? he's a prize fighter and he wants more money. prizes. And he has the biggest prize. But he wants another prize. It, it, yeah, money. Prizes equal money. I just don't think it makes sense. Doesn't, uh, what's his name? Was Conor biggest... McGregor, doesn't he have two prizes? Doesn't he get more money now? Yeah, pretty much. I, I, I do think that they should do that. <laughs> Unfortunately, they're not. And it's probably not even going to be addressed. Of course not. Maybe that's a way to predict. Maybe I, maybe this is like a means to uh, really see how this match is going to go. Maybe Kevin Owens does end up winning, so they don't take the U.S. title off of Reigns. Maybe uh, maybe I have to change my prediction because too late. If too Kevin late. Owens, yeah, it's true. I'm locked in. But if um, maybe it just says that Roman is going to lose, so that way that uh, Roman can still be U.S. champion after this match. I don't know. I don't I don't think it's a big deal. I don't care. Whatever. So thank you for the question. Our next one comes in from Adam V, who asks, 
did you think you would ever care about a go-home roadblock show? The answer is no, and I still really don't. <laughs> <laughs> I care Ditto. more about the end of the line more than roadblock. Because this is it. End, end of the line. This is you know, the end of the line, folks. Last year when they made roadblock. It was this year. It was this oh, yes, year. You know what? This year. Yes, sorry. I was thinking of it in like WWE pay-per-view cycles where I know this is a dumb like uh, and this is a dumb way to think, but like WrestleMania to WrestleMania is a pay-per-view year to me. No, that's no, I, I totally get you, man. Like that like, is the in, WWE in the last, calendar. In the last cycle when they called it roadblock. It was dumb, but I could get behind it because, oh, it's a roadblock on the road to WrestleMania. Where's the road to WrestleMania this year? Now it's just roadblock for being the sake of roadblock. They because took it's the, one... the end of the line. It's the what end. line? It's the end of the year. The calendar year. The end is here. So you're going to the end of the line to get on another road. That seems like poor directional skills. Get some Google Maps happening here. Right? It seems like you could have made a turn somewhere that would prevent this. It Roadblock seems like you're wasting the line time. brought to you by Apple Maps. Maybe it's just one big episode of Ride Along. <laughs> Ride Along? This is like an episode of Ride Along on the WWE Network. We need to move on. So thank you for the question. Our next one comes in from Cynical Justice. Cynical <laughs> Justin. 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 <laughs> this is even better. <laughs> We're off the rails, Megal. Man. Jeez. All right. So Cynical Justin asks, if you could change up the mid card to make it your ideal version of what it would look like, what would it look like and why? I would actually just take something like what The Miz is doing and just have more superstars with that type of over-the-top personality. Because when you look at SmackDown... The Miz is, has become so good in the mid card because he is technically part of the mid card. He's the IC champion that he almost feels like he's part of the championship, like the WWE world title picture, because there's nobody at his level. So you can have your Mr. Perfect. You can have your superstars that are amazing, you know, future Hall of Famers, but that they don't have to win the main title. Bring somebody up like that. I would uh, let's see here, uh, like a really good example, you know, like Azami Zayn on SmackDown. I think that would have thrived because he would have forced himself to develop that personality to really match up to The Miz. Or it could have been the next Dana Bryan, The Miz, you know, where they did have that rivalry in NXT where the whole thing was Dana Bryan. He's got no personality. So then that's the storyline. And then you have Dana Bryan in SmackDown. That story writes itself. So I would try to figure out ways to get a really over the top character as the champion and then somebody whose story is to get to that level. I think they tried that with Apollo Crews. That did not work. By yeah. the way, that Gabriel and Glacius thing on uh, on SmackDown. Oof. That was terrible. And and he's fu he's a funny guy too. And th that's the best and they could fluffy. give him. Yeah, they give him a Uranus joke. He's a he's a professional comedian, and that's what they give him. Was he doing I'm DDP yoga? What happened? I don't know. Apparently, he's not doing it enough. He may have to go to the, uh, what is it, uh, accountability crib or something yeah, like that? Yeah, or just that get the sound called? system. Yeah. Um. So, for my ideal mid-card, essentially, I would, like Juan, I would want The Miz, at least on SmackDown side, I think he's, he's great in the mid-card, and he's kind of like the ideal mid-card heel, but it's just we need to get some more people on his level, so... Yeah, I would like to see guys like Apollo Crews and even Baron Corbin, and you can even throw in like Rhino and Heath Slater. Like, ideally, you have guys that are all perceived as players in that realm, kind of like how the SmackDown's women division, the women's division is right now, where any one of those women feels like they're on the level that they could become women's champion. We need that going on at the mid-card levels on both shows. Sami Zayn should feel like he could win the U.S. title at any moment, just like you feel like, hey, Carmella could probably win the women's uh, title. Did I say the women's title? Yeah. What did I, yes. did I say something weird? <laughs> no, right, no. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Okay. Whatever. All right. 
Um, but anyway, what I was saying is, at, basically, they need to build both mid card divisions like they've built the SmackDown women's division because that is a way to just make it feel like there's a lot of players on that tier. The mid, my ideal mid card is weird because. I have an answer, but also one of the strongest parts of the current mid card is almost like the opposite of my answer because the Miz is great at what he does. And I don't want to discredit him as like a cornerstone of the WWE mid card, but my ideal mid card is like that's where the great matches happen. Like the great storylines are on the upper cards and the the storylines that the show is focused are usually around the main titles. But leave the mid cards to just like, hey, these are where the five star matches live. Kind of like what we got with the John Cena US Open Challenge. There wasn't a lot of story behind it week to week where it's just John Cena's coming out. He says something and boom, we have an incredible match right after it. If there was a version of that that didn't involve a superstar that's perceived to be on like uh, like above the rest of these people giving an opportunity where it was like equal playing field and just incredible matches all the time i think that would be my ideal mid card where you have people like that build these great characters like the miz like um what you have with aj styles dean ambrose james ellsworth that all is on the upper card the main event that's where the stories go but at the same time, the WWE is – now that I'm thinking about it, the WWE has done that wrong because if you look back a couple years ago, we were getting all right matches between like Alberto Del Rio, Jack Swagger, Sheamus, Cesaro, all of those like a combination of that group every week were getting like half an hour matches on Raw and after a while it just became intolerable. So I don't know. That's an interesting question. The, the one thing I want to add to that – is based on your closing comment there where I think that the John Cena effect and the Miz effect are the exception to the rule because outside of those guys, everything else that you get is your Jack Swagger, is your Alberto Del Rio and things like that. So I, I think it's just a really, really big problem that doesn't really have that much of a solution, but I do think the mid card gets more freedom or cre- they can get more creative with the storylines because you look at you know the Miz and I think that that goes to show that do you want to move up the ladder? Because it seems like you become limited when it comes to your character or the segments that you can do when you do that. It's a good point. So thank you for the question. Our next one comes from another lovely, beautiful patron of this show, B. Seagrist. Bo, I believe. Bo. And they ask, Greetings, men. Hello. As of right now, I believe the WWE main roster is without a faction, by this definition meaning four or more members in a group. Are you guys in favor of factions, and do you think we will see one in 2017 come together? If so, who would you like to see together? Always a great show. Thank you for the consideration. Well, you're quite welcome. Um... I would not be against maybe another person joining the Wyatt family to have more of a faction thing going on. Big Red's got to come back sometime, baby. Yeah, exactly. Other than that, though, honestly, I think things are fine the way they are. I'm a, I'm a little weary of having a lot of factions right now because the rosters feel like thin at the moment where if you group a bunch of guys together then that's that many less people you can have face other people it almost at this point feels like it limits your options more than helps but you know seeing something like the new day versus the wyatt family as sort of a faction v faction cross brand thing would be something really cool so I I wouldn't mind kind of one faction going on on either show. I like what they're doing with the Wyatt family. They should kind of just be the faction on uh, SmackDown. But if the New Day breaks up, it would be cool to see some sort of faction on Raw. Like you could do Finn Balor in the club if you really wanted to do the whole club thing again. Uh, That could be interesting. So that would probably be the one I would choose for Raw. Factions are a beautiful thing for the first little while. Because when you think about DX, Nexus, even like a nation of the domination, Wolfpack, NWO, sooner or later, 
something falls apart. And when you think about the conclusion of the faction, I think it's rarely, my God, that was an amazing closure. Just think about the way they concluded that. And it's because the initial thing of, man, these, these people are coming to take over are so fun that when you realize, no, they're just, they're just a big tag team, that sort of gets put down a little bit. Unless you go maybe like the NWO route to, to an extent where, yeah, it's a group of people, but then this guy wants to become world champion. They want to become tag champions. But right now, because we got the brand split, I don't think factions would work so much because what I want out of them is a brand warfare. It's basically what we got at Survivor Series where I would sort of rather have this group come together temporarily, build a kick-ass storyline, kind of like how we got at Survivor Series, and then we duke it out between Raw and SmackDown Live because unless it's something like the White Family, I mean, we got Sanity. Sanity and NXT is a faction, even though right now they're going through some changes or something like that. But how far can they go? I don't think they can go very far, but because they're so early in that run, I'm not going to comment about that a little bit more. But anybody that hasn't watched NXT, Sanity is a three to four man group with a female. And uh, yeah, they're just getting started. The problem with factions is that they uh, really limit individual like individual presences on the roster. And that is something that the... uh, the WWE main roster is really lacking. It's something that could really fall apart at a moment's notice. And if you throw everybody in a faction, then you're really just limiting yourself like uh, like the other two guys here have said. And I don't think that's something that the WWE needs right now until you've built strong individuals on your roster. And I think that's what the bulk of 2017 should be building individuals, building superstars, starting to fill those voids with what you have. So we don't have a situation like we talked about earlier, where it's in the uh, SmackDown main event scene. It's either Dean Ambrose, Dolph Ziggler, I guess, AJ Styles and John Cena. Build the people up to that and then have maybe even almost have like a legacy situation later on where you have those established, established superstars take people under their wings. And then have that um, that be your version of a faction. Now, even though there's like not any factions that like fit the four people or more uh, definition here, I always perceive the Wyatt family as more of a faction than anything. That's a, that's how I've always felt about it. And yeah, I think eventually we will see another member of it because Eric Rowan's on SmackDown, right? Yeah, because he got I injured. Think so. Luke yeah. Harper was the one that was undrafted, and then he showed up. Because there's no way. There's yeah, no, no way Rowan, that Eric Rowan gets a singles run right Yeah, when Rowan he comes was back. 100% on SmackDown, because he was part of that whole Randy Orton, like, right, Randy right, Orton right, was right, feuding right. with Wyatt. Mm-hmm. But, I don't know, even with, uh, with less people, I still consider the Wyatt family a faction. Really always have. So, thank you for the question. Our final question of the show comes from Juan B., who asks, will Alexa Bliss be the next big thing in 2017? Just to clarify, that's actually not me. It's B, not V. Just want to make clear. <laughs> it's not me shoehorning a you question want in v, here. You V, that one B. I sure. think she's already kind of become a thing in 2016. Will she get on the level of, say, like Charlotte and Sasha? On the SmackDown side, I think she has a ton of potential to to do so. So I would say yes. Yeah, I agree. I think the 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 big difference between Raw and SmackDown is that even though SmackDown has the better women's roster, in my opinion, and division as a whole, Raw does a better job of letting you know these two ones, these two women are the top ones, and everybody else is below them. So even though Alexa Bliss is awesome. She's still at the same level as everybody else because that's how the division is and that's how it should be, right? But maybe we do get to a point in 2017 where she is so good at what she does that it's starting to look like, okay, somebody's got to go up to her level. And at the same time, they should, right? Because otherwise, then the whole thing becomes stale, which is what we just talked about, you know, with the main event scene with the guys like Ambrose and Ziggler. Yeah, I agree. The uh, calling a woman like the next big thing of the women's division on SmackDown is almost feels counterproductive to me and really uh, goes against what makes the uh, SmackDown women's division so strong. Like Juan mentioned, 
the reason why it's so great is because everybody's kind of on the same level. You don't have this issue of cuz on I would say on the raw side you could either are you could create an argument like is Sasha or is Sasha Banks or Charlotte the next big thing because that's the way they're perceived over there. It's them and then everybody else. And then uh SmackDown just doesn't have that problem. So from that point of view I would I don't want to see Alexa Bliss like transcend everybody else because I think that almost weakens the division as a whole. But I would love to see Alexa Bliss be a mainstay and like a serious contender or a serious cornerstone to the division itself. Yeah, it's a tricky line you have to walk because you can look at it like, oh, it'd be nice if Alexa Bliss becomes more of a name in the world, right? In in mainstream. But like you can look at like Austin in the Attitude Era. And even though he was like the biggest star, you still felt like there were guys in the mix that could beat Austin at any moment, like Undertaker or The Rock or whoever. There were still a lot of players in the mix, even if they weren't the biggest name, you still felt that they were a uh, like a... What's the word I'm looking a for? A threat or somebody at their level. Formidable a opponent is what I was looking for. Yeah, excellent point about that. And, and re- really good question. Because when you think about somebody like Reigns, right? Where the WWE tried to establish that person to that level, look at what happened. So would something like that happen with Alexa Bliss? You know, but we, we can find out possibly because it's, I think at some point you got to excel. You got to build somebody up to a completely different level. But thanks to everybody for sending in your awesome questions. Remember, we got some homework because all of you send us them tweets or emails or comments on YouTube about your favorite Christmas present. We're going to be talking about that a little bit next week just to celebrate the holidays, just to ho- celebrate the good times. Get your Pringles ready for Sunday, folks. Oh, yeah. I don't know what flavor. I, I don't know if they got pizza around here. I know they, I know I can get pizza, but not pizza flavor. Pr- oh, my God. What if you get a pizza? And then you add pizza flavored Pringles on top as a topping. That's called ruining your delicious pizza. <laughs> yes, I'm oh. with Ryan on that one. Oh, damn. Well, Ryan, may, may as well close the show. All right. Well, on that note, hashtag roadblock to Pringles. We want to thank everyone for listening to another edition of the Bite That podcast. Before we go, just a few quick reminders. Head over to the YouTube channel for some of our bonus content, youtube.com forward slash bite that cast. Juan's pro wrestling loot unboxings up there. We got some cool stuff coming. Is uh, what's coming up this Friday, Juan? Uh, Nothing on Friday because we changed our schedule. Oh, oh, that's right. (laughs) Nothing's coming up on Friday. I'm already forgetting the channel update, right? The uh, correct me, Juan. Correct me because I totally botched. What is happening? Okay. So here we go. Our schedule right now is that every Wednesday we publish the podcast, and now on the weekends you either get a roundtable, you get an unboxing video, you can get a play that, or you can get a pay per view review. So this weekend you're going to be getting a pay per view review. Oh, that's right. Review. <laughs> I'm already forgetting. We switched things up, so forgive me on that one. This my bad. This one's on me. I got to pull an art truth there. <laughs> So, yeah, we're going to have a roadblock review. So look for that late, late Sunday night, uh, depending on how far overrun that that pay-per-view goes. But there will be a roadblock review. So, yeah, that's a thing. Anyway, if you want to interact with us on social media, Twitter at ByteThatCast. Want to send us an email, ByteThatCast at gmail.com. For everything else, you can head over to ByteThat.com. If you want to support what it is we do, the best way to do so, besides being awesome and interacting with us, is heading over to patreon.com slash bite that. For as little as $1, you can get a raw and uncut video version of the podcast, plus tons of other features, so you can head over there and check that out. I'm going to get out of here because I'm getting face palms from the other two guys. So thank you guys for listening. Enjoy Roblox, enjoy the weekend, and we'll see you next week.